All right. Hey guys, welcome back to Unfrazzled Entrepreneur, the podcast where we help you get unfrazzled. Well, we talked about what unfrazzled means in episode one and who we feel like this podcast is for. I'm Ryan Rieger and this is my good friend, Stephen Hibbert. And today we are going to introduce Hello. ourselves. I know some of you may know us. If any of you listen to my podcast, Streams of Income, you've already heard my story. But for those of you that are new, we want to introduce who we are so you know where we're coming from things we've done in our business to get us to this point and our um, talk about our vision for what unfrazzled on for what we see for this podcast moving forward. And so this episode, we're going to say who we are and why we're here. But of course, my name is Ryan Rieger. I was um, in politics in Indiana, born and raised in Indiana and moved to Texas in 2008 after working for an unsuccessful political campaign in 2008. Um, we lost that race, so I moved to Texas and I knew two things were gonna happen. Um, that I was moving here and then I was getting married, that's all. I had no idea how I was gonna provide for me and my um, about to be wife, but i would always been an entrepreneur at heart. I listened to Jim Cockrum's uh, or watched, watched, listened to all his content, read his book, Silent Sales Machine, and really, knew at some point I wanted to have my own business, but I had no idea what that was. Um, then moving here, I saw that my wife and mother-in-law had a furniture business. They were selling furniture on Craigslist, very part-time. And I thought, this is it. This is my ticket to uh, becoming an entrepreneur. I don't have a job anyway. And my wife says, no, <laughs> go get a job. Didn't want me to uh, jump in the furniture business because I guess she didn't think it was going to be successful because they were just doing it part-time. But I saw the potential. And so I agreed to spend part of my time searching for a job and part of my time uh, posting ads on Craigslist secretly. Spent way more time on the business because that really what excited me. And in 2009, we sold $250,000 worth of furniture um, wow. on Craigslist just in the Dallas-Fort Worth nice. area. So that really gave us some confidence. Yes, this can work. This is what we're going to do. So we did that for a few years. We had a store for a year. Didn't enjoy that at all because it meant we had to be in the, at the <laughs> store, even when it wasn't busy and we couldn't work from our from home in our pajamas anymore. But um, and the reason we had to had to have the stores, because when we got a letter in the mail from our city saying we could no longer run a furniture business out of our house. And one of our neighbors complained because we had people coming to pick up furniture at our home. So that was immediately a, a blow. But. The Lord provided, found us, helped us find some really inexpensive retail space at about 2,500 square feet. So it was a small little store. Um, it was mainly a hub for our online business. But what that opened up was the opportunity for us to ship nationwide because now we could have commercial trucks like, you know, big semis come to that store, back up, and we could load it with the furniture and we could ship all over the place, which really helped our business. And then we found a warehouse. And then, um, but soon after that, in 2012, we woke up one day and saw that a lot of our ads were deleted on Craigslist. And that was a, a kind of a, a panic moment. Like, what are we going to do? Our business is going to just die right here. But again, the Lord had a plan. And in the summer of 2012, uh, my friend Jim Cockrum had an auction on eBay for his book, 101 Free Marketing. So it was a essentially a fundraiser for Hope Village in Detroit, an organization that he really cares about. And so I woke up the morning of the auction and I knew, I just knew in my heart that I needed to win that. Um, and so I went to my wife and I said, we have to win this auction because it wasn't because of the book. It was because there was a 30 minute phone call with Jim as a part of it. And so I, uh, she said, how much do you think we need to bid? I said, I think we need to bid $1,500, which, you know, to, you know, Stephen and I now that's not, you know, it's a decent amount of money, but it's then it was a whole lot of money. It was a big <laughs> deal. And so <laughs> we stepped out in faith. I bid and we won. And so instead of a 30 minute phone call, I messaged Jim went after winning and said, Hey, my parents live pretty close to you. Can Melaine and I fly up to Indiana, take you out to lunch. He agreed to do that for, he agreed and spent two hours with us, Stephen at lunch. And we, um, he told us about Amazon FBA fulfillment by Amazon. And so what that allowed us to do was to slowly decrease the amount of furniture we were selling and shipping all over the place and focus more on the small items, which was way easier. 
because they could just pack it all up, put it in a box, send it to Amazon, and then they could sell it for us. And then when a sale was I made, ask you a question. Yeah, go for it. I, I want to come back to that story, but I, I just, I think I identified something. When you were doing the furniture business, did mm-hmm. you have uh, someone else or a mentor or relationship with somebody else that was doing it to be able to ask those questions too? We did not have a mentor in the furniture business, no. So it was just you having an idea, trying it out, having a little bit of success, then having yes. that pain point with the people shutting you down, you can't sell it out of your house, and then having to move and adjust. Yes. Then you found Jim and had somebody that you could relate to while you were going through this, I would say like second half of this entrepreneur journey or, right. or next chapter, I'll say it like that because I don't want to section out like that but from that point did you identify like oh this is more enjoyable easier harder less enjoyable to to have somebody that's ahead of you or at least somebody that you can look oh, yeah. up to or well, i'd always like to. followed him like for business ideas for specific furniture stuff we didn't have anybody we were following or looking at um so yeah but yes absolutely I, community is key having a mentor either having a coach or a mentor or a community or all of the above is super important uh, in in business success for sure yeah Yeah, like i love this entrepreneur journey and i i think i just identified that now like the first part of most people's entrepreneur journey is a solo journey right it's up and down it's crazy it's like very stressful you're doing a lot of stuff on your own you're 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 doing a lot of things that probably stretch you and you're not like fully understanding how to solve problems and you're just constantly like feeling like you're behind and i think this is where we have that un like the over worked underpaid feeling frustrated i think this ties perfectly into the the frazzled part of becoming an unfrazzled entrepreneur i think that finding other people finding community is part of this becoming yes. an unfrazzled oh, entrepreneur totally. i just wanted to identify that now because no, that's great I've probably seen it before but not identified it through this unfrazzled absolutely. concept absolutely that relationship so after building after meeting him that started a friendship a relationship a mentorship that uh has been worth hundreds of thousands of dollars Mm. um, because of the Mm. partnerships i've been able to do with him ideas that i've had ideas he's had um, where we've worked together on books i've created courses i've created member mentorship programs Um, the q4 group for example that we do every year uh, just little all, all that stuff um that has happened because of that relationship that started then. And so uh, in, I, I wrote a book called Real Wholesale Sources soon after meeting him, he promoted it. That got me into the information world. And I had the, I saw the power of, you know, I wrote a piece of content that people wanted and I got paid for it. That blew my mind and excited me all at the same time. And so I've, I've written several <laughs> books now. Jim's promoted all of them. And uh, I've had other people promote him too, but it, um, he has, he's by far has the biggest email list of, you know, my the people that I associate with. And um, then I had the start, started the legends group in 2016. And that is, uh, that's really my heart. I love membership communities. I love that. Um, just the, instead of creating a course one time and like, here it is guys have at it, you know, you don't really know those people that write, read your book or, or go through your course. But having that community, and so real quick, what a membership community typically is, I learned this from my friend Shane Sams, three things. There's content, it's community, and it's coaching. So the content is essentially an online course, or maybe it's a library of courses. In our case, in the Legend Group, it's like a library of courses on how to sell on Amazon and other places. And now we're adding all kinds of other stuff into it too. Then there's the community. And then the last in the community could be a Facebook group. It could be a Mighty Networks forum. It could be on Circle. There's other, Kajabi even now has a forum. It's just a place where people can go in, ask questions and get get questions answered and just hang out. And then the third is the coaching. And that's, you know, going live in the group two to three times a month with Q&As or it could be bringing on an expert. And um, that is, uh, that by far is the most fulfilling part of my business, having that community. We call it a family. And I really think that, um, you know, anybody could have a membership community. Plus it provides that, you know, that multiple, that monthly recurring revenue, we call it MRR. And it's um, what every business needs. So that's pretty much my story. I've been doing the Legends community. I built some other communities. And then now this new venture with you, Stephen, of uh, helping people um, be unfrazzled and, uh, you know, see the, see how they can take their business to another level and provide you know virtual assistance, which is a whole other topic we could talk about. My heart for that and creating those win wins. So 
it's my story. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm, I am, I identify as a entrepreneur. I, I really love hearing other people's stories. And I think my entrepreneur journey is unique like everybody else's, but it, it is a, I'm trying to always identify what somebody else is doing successfully uh-huh. and then try to mirror copy that. I think as I tell my story, they're going to be <laughs> places where it's like, oh, he stole that idea. And I go, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> but I started okay. by selling car parts. And if I really think about it, it came from my father who was a mechanic. He would buy cars, fix them up, sell them or work on other people's cars. And then going to a junkyard to find the parts because most of the cars that he worked on were older was just the way that you did it. You didn't really go to the parts store too much. So on one of the trips to the junkyard, I pulled apart and then sold it to a friend of mine yeah. just from seeing what my father was doing. So this awesome. journey of entrepreneurship kind of started by just looking at what other people were doing. I think like you, that there are solo years in the entrepreneur journey. Like I wasn't doing it with my dad. I just kind of saw what he was doing, emulated it, and then tried mm-hmm. to apply it myself. That yes. I made money off. And that was the first time where I, I made a decent amount of money at one time without a ton of work. I mean, I worked at McDonald's, I worked at a ton of restaurants and everything else and just realized like, that's not what I want to do. There's no right. job that someone's going to be able to tell me to come in here and clock out here. Cause I, I'm very creative and it just like always stifles my creativity. At least yes. that, when I was 14, 15 going through that, that was what I was yeah. going through. So you mentioned after- something key right there. You started with something that you knew. And so there's many ways to start. You could have said, you know what, I think I'm going to go to school and learn how to be a, a coder <laughs> and, and develop video games. You could have done that, but that would have been way outside of your your skill set. It had nothing to do with anything you previously done. You were doing car parts. You thought, let's start there. And so, guys, that's a big key is if you're trying to decide where to go, if you're, I know a lot of people listen to this, the goal is for people who are kind of already started their business and they're trying to get unfrazzled and uh, scale or you know, not have to do everything in their business. That's the main goal. But if you're listening to this and you're at the beginning, you're like, where do I start? Just start with that lowest hanging fruit. What's right in front of you? What's something you already know? What's something you have? Maybe it's selling something around your house that you set junk sitting in your garage, get it on Facebook marketplace, start bringing in some income. But that's good. You started with car parts because you knew car parts. And so that's, you know, it's brilliant. It, it just meant you didn't have to learn a completely new skill. Uh, and that was an easy entrance point for you. So start with the least, you know, the least, the path of least resistance. Just Lowest hanging action. fruit. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a, that's another ongoing theme in everything I'm doing is trying to find the lowest hanging fruit, something that I can, I know starting anything is difficult. I'm trying to look for the quickest way to success. And I think that's why I identified like emulating. I, I, I know this can be done because I've seen it. I saw what my dad was doing. I sold that car part to a friend, but mm-hmm. there was just something that like a light bulb went off. This yeah. can be done. I could do this again. How do I sell more of this? So just talking to a lot of friends and seeing what they were working on, what car parts they might look for. And then I had a, like a hit list when I went to the junkyard. Yeah. And I would pull those parts. Mm-hmm. And then it's sell a bolo those. list. That, yes. Be on the lookout type <laughs> of list because you knew what would sell. That's another reason to start with what you know, because like if, if you put me in that exact same position at the same time when you were doing that, a head-to-head competition, who's going to sell the most car parts? Oh my goodness, clearly you're going to win because yes. I don't know car parts. I know names of some of them, but I probably, embarrassingly, will tell you, I probably couldn't look at a certain part and be like, oh, that's a radiator hose. Um, I, I'm probably not going to know the, now if it's something obvious, the steering wheel, okay, come on. <laughs> But like you knew car parts. And so you have an advantage with that because it was something you already knew. So guys start with what you know, that you have a huge advantage. Whenever we're telling somebody who's selling on Amazon, where do I start in this huge store that I'm looking at? Pick an aisle that, you know, pick an aisle that has things that you're, if you're into fishing, go to the fishing section, cause you're going to know those things. And so, yeah, yeah that's a great business point. Yeah. Right, back I, I to think- your story. <laughs> seeing you being able to identify like the things that I was doing back then. I think this is why I love being around other entrepreneurs, the solo years. It's like, you're just doing the thing to see if you can find success. Like even when you're selling furniture, it's just like you're, you're stumbling through all these things. But if somebody was like a successful furniture owner store, yeah, they could tell you, Hey, don't waste your time on this. You want to sell products at this point. Like yeah. they, they'd be able to give you the information to speed up a bunch of time, energy, yes. and effort that you've spent just trying to learn the basics. Because if you yes. would tell me hey, you have a bolo list, tell bolo be on the lookout for. 
it is what I was doing, but it, yeah. I say it quickly in the story where it's like, oh, the next day I had a, li-. it was months and months and months to like, sure. who has a car part, who's working on, oh, your father's doing yeah. this on an old Trans Am. I think I saw a Trans Am over at this, sh- this junkyard and being able to like yeah. piecemeal out together a ton yes. of time, energy and effort, but it was enjoyable to me because it was like, I, I, it's not a job. It's not a nine to five and I can get paid for doing something that I semi enjoy. Yes. Was your the next um, part the of the car? Did you love, <laughs> um, did you love the car parts? Was that f- super, super fun? Or was that just a means to just create some income? I think as I look back, it was enjoyable because I was doing it with my father. And yeah. it, it, like, I've always kind of turned wrenches and been greasy. So at the time, I think it was fun. Yes. It snowed every year in Michigan. And one year we had an ice storm and a friend of mine really needed a car park because he was about to go to the track. Uh-huh. So I went out to pull that. And I, that was the day where I was like, this is not fun. Like mm. it's fun in a very like hyper specific point. Like when yeah. my father is driving and going to a junkyard and I go with <laughs> him and he drives and I have the, his tools, that's when it's fun. When yeah. I have to go in my own car and get my own parts and talk to the people and pull the part and be in the cold, mm, that's not fun. not fun. It's the same task, but yeah. this one's hyper specialized where it's like, I only like this for these reasons. And I think this also helped me in my journey to like looking back going, why didn't I like that? And what was the next thing? It was very easy. I I didn't like the cold. It snowed. Everything was frozen. I banged up my knuckles. I was bleeding. It was just like after getting that, it was probably the most money I made in that. But I was like, if this is what it is, I don't want to do this. But I do like the selling aspect. Just just that cold day made me realize like, what is it that I like about this? And what is that that I don't like about Mm -hmm. this? And then let me try to find something that fits more of the like than the don't right. like. So I was like, outside, whatever the parts are, they can't be outside, they have to be inside because mm-hmm. I like heat, <laughs> I hate yeah. snow. So if it's something I wanna do all year round in Michigan, it has to be something that I'm buying inside. So then right. I was just looking at how do I do that? I sold a couple of parts on Craigslist. That's what gave me the idea to sell on eBay and just like looking on eBay and what's selling on eBay. Car parts, but then just like in general, what is mm-hmm. selling and then seeing again I'm, i don't know if i leaned into like my expertise more than just like oh a lot of this stuff looks like stuff that i see in a like thrift store i should go to the thrift store and just educate myself on that because it checks these boxes of what i yeah. like I, I like buying the thing selling the thing working at my own hours this seems like another opportunity to do that so i was just yeah. selling a whole bunch of used stuff on ebay then i think like you just trying to educate myself listening to pot they weren't podcasts, but listening to some YouTube videos because YouTube was around reading books and just trying to figure out different things. Then I stumbled across how to sell on Amazon. And I was like, yeah. oh, th- there are other selling platforms. There's different ways to do this. I don't have to have all this stuff in my house because one of the next pain points I ran into after the cold was my wife didn't want car parts and stuff all over, all over the, the house. house. Yeah, <laughs> I had it like stacked up on the dining room table. And she yeah. was like, I love you. I love what you're doing, but this, <laughs> we're this done with is this. not cool. <laughs> the reason I asked you that, if you enjoyed it is because um, I, th- I know we hear talk, people talk about do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, I'll be honest. Like I didn't, I, I don't care about furniture, never cared about furniture. Was there an element was, of that that you enjoyed? Oh, I, yes, 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 absolutely. So um, there was a grace on it that like, if I, if you tell me that I had to go back and do that over again, go, post ads on Craigslist, go to that warehouse, pick it all up, po- throw it in the back of a trailer, drive all over the Metroplex and do <laughs> deliveries. That sounds like a nightmare. The whole furniture business to me now sounds like a nightmare. But while I was doing it, it was freedom because I didn't have a regular job. I was able to work as much or as little as I wanted. I was able to drive all over the, I, I enjoyed driving around town. Um, I enjoyed most of the customers we had. I um, enjoyed going to the, work. yes. So I enjoyed it then. I didn't, like the actual furniture didn't care about furniture it could have been pigs or cows that i was selling it didn't matter it was um and so i just want to encourage somebody who's thinking you know i have to find something i love to get started it doesn't have to be maybe if it is that's great that's why i asked you about the car for did you enjoy that and it sounds like you did but if there's somebody sitting here listening like well, right in front of me is this opportunity but it doesn't really sound like that's my end all be all goal as an entrepreneur to do that thing that's okay maybe you do that for a couple years and get going get some money and then you're able to jump into those other things you love most entrepreneurs if you talk to them 
their business looks nothing like it did when they started. Agree. Uh, agree. So it's okay to go into that position that is like, this is right here in front of me. This is the lowest hanging fruit. I'm not so sure I'm going to absolutely love this. And I know I don't want to do this in five years. That's cool. Do it right now. Get it going. Get some money. Maybe you can sell that opportunity off like we sold the furniture business off. Maybe you completely pivot into something else. Maybe you'll end up loving it because now it becomes profitable. And so that's a whole other conversation and, and you know, a, a philosophical question we can break down. But um, I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing a lot more consulting now. And I, I think that's another question is like, I ask them, what are your goals? What are you trying to do with this business? Yeah. And I do hear that quite a bit is like money. I just want to make the money. Yeah. I think this helps me understand like the, the position that they're in, in their journey. Because I would say, if you ask me like, do you like doing the car parts? No, but I enjoyed the money yes. aspect of it. I think this is what happens is as soon as that pain point overcomes the amount of money that you're making, then it just helps yes. you refine what it is that you're truly enjoying yes. or like about yes. what you're doing. Because like I said, it I, if it never snowed, I might have kept doing it or I would have hit yeah. another pain point where it's like, I, I don't like this aspect of it yeah. where I'm constantly, I'm now driving to the shops. I'm constantly talking to all these people and having yeah. to figure out making relationships. And I go, mm, the, I don't like that. I'm sure there would have been something because it wasn't like a pure bliss that I was doing all that stuff. I think now as I've done a lot of these different ideas and gone through it, just it's a constant refining to go, what is it that I want? I think as you start yes. off as an entrepreneur, like you're doing it because you don't like the job, but you need mm -hmm. the money. So you start mm -hmm. a thing like you with the furniture, with me, with the car parts, you just do something for the money. But then yes. as you do it and get better and gain skills, you refine what it is that you like. And then I believe there's going to be a pain point where the, the money is not enough to overcome the pain points, but you now right. have skills and identify what you do like, and then take yes. that to the next level. I think that's why I love the entrepreneur journey. Cause it's always like, yeah. I started here and now I'm way over here. And then I go, how did you get there? Like, what were the aha moments mm. in that? I think the first one is you want money and then you hit a pain point. Sure. Then it's like, that's the next refining stage of this entrepreneur's journey. Yes. I think it also starts with the solo side of it. All of this was yeah. pretty solo until I started reading the books and educating myself and then trying to reach mm -hmm. out to people and go, hey, I would like to learn this. Can at least we have conversations? In the book that I read about how to sell on Amazon, the fo his phone number was in there and started calling and reaching out to him and go, <laughs> I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know you could ask right. other people. <laughs> who are also doing this thing. Cause I always assume like business is competition. You're always competing with the other person, but it's just not always like that. Normally right. when you get in an industry, like everybody's trying to help each other grow mm -hmm. and get better and understand. Cause everybody understands like it's a constant learning, growing and the market is constantly changing. So yeah, if you're at the top right now and you think you're killing it, give it a couple of months a year, you're also going to be on the back end trying to figure this thing out. So you need that community to help you, but I'll go back yeah. to my story. From Craigslist, selling on eBay to then on Amazon. Amazon now is where I'd say it changes from solo to now I like, I'm, I'm in a little bit of community. I don't have a mentor. I haven't sat down with yeah. anybody, but just selling on Amazon, retail arbitrage, buying stuff from stores, buying stuff online, selling it online. And then I heard about private label. And then I also won an auction <laughs> yes. and found out and sat down with somebody for two hours and just <laughs> emulating their success and seeing what they're doing to build that yes. relationship. And I think this is where it really kind of helped me to the next level to go, oh, I don't have to just like learn from these other people. We can partner up. We can have a bunch of different ideas. We can do all these things. That's when I started having digital products, selling, coaching, teaching, going and speaking at live events, like just like a whole new realm opened up where I was like, mm -hmm. I, I would have never assumed I would have done any of that. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed being successful in a thing, but then to like teach other people was like, I don't, why would I ever enjoy that? But then I was like, that's the thing I really like. Yeah. And I think from that private label, launching brands, then teaching, I transferred into consulting, which I'm doing right now and I love. And it yeah. provides me enough income to then invest yeah. in other things. So now I'm doing real estate. Yeah. I'm enjoying like the path that I'm on and also yeah. the current like status of what I'm doing. I wake up every day energized and excited because I think like the questions you asked, did you enjoy it? I didn't enjoy a lot of those things going through it, but it just helped me identify what is the thing that I really like. Yeah, I love helping you, When you were people. doing the car parts, did you have any idea that you'd ever be doing consulting? No. I, I think I identified early on what I liked about it, which was yeah. helping people. I'm helping this person get what they need, providing a service, yeah. and I'm getting paid. But the, the biggest yeah. piece of it for me that I enjoyed was the helping. I think that's why as soon as I went like deep into private label and everything, I was like, I don't feel like I'm helping. This is very lucrative. 
but I, I'm losing what it is that I like about any of this. I hate the yeah. logistics of it. I We can set up a lot of things where an email goes out and it gets sent to another person and the shipment comes over and it's all back and I don't have to touch anything, but I don't, I didn't enjoy it. Now looking yeah. back, what I should have done is like set it up correctly and sold it as a business because it would have really helped me. But I just, mm. uh, entrepreneur, just like light it on fire. Because <laughs> that's fire. been the tra- trajectory of everything. It's just like, it was whatever your, I was just is a doing, journey of discovery. Like yes. you just, um, you could have been back in Michigan thinking, what do I want to do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's wait until I really find exactly what I love. And you might just be sitting there still trying to figure that out. Without yeah, taking action, action, I think, is that first. Yes, I think this yep. is something we should talk about a lot on this Take podcast. Action. And the- we, we talk about with action comes clarity. So just mm-hmm. start something. What is right in front of you? Sell that thing. Do that <laughs> course. If you feel like you're more of a coach, post on Facebook that you're going to take some coaching clients. See if you enjoy it. You may not. You may love it. But you got to take action. And I, guys, my I haven't sold a piece of furniture in years. <laughs> But that got me started and that was the foundation and that put me on the journey for that set me up to have enough money to be able to then do other things and explore other things. And eventually we just sold that off. So that's fascinating. I love hearing people's stories because it's it's usually just pivoting and trying to figure out like, oh, I like this. Oh, I don't like this. So I don't like this. Let's not do that anymore. Let's try to do less of that anyway. Let's focus on this. Well, in the meantime, you still have your other things going, hopefully. Um, like you yeah, said, not, I did not, and that's a big lesson burned, I learned. You burned yeah. them up, but you could <laughs> that's have, not the good way to do it. <laughs> you could have had potentially had a, um, you know, still, you could potentially still be selling car parts. If you had yes. a team that was running that mm-hmm. for you mm-hmm. and it was a, a machine pumping out money that, that you just kind of, or you just kind of check in from time to time. And then you're, but then you're able to focus on what you really love. So yeah, I think the fun. book E-Myth really helped me identify like, oh, I am a true entrepreneur. I love yeah. building the house, the business, the systems, the SOPs, but I don't like managing or getting too into the nitty gritty after it's a repeatable process. That's right. why I need to hand it off. So coming to that realization and going like, how do I now be an entrepreneur and still be able to function without like burning? Because I think a lot of other entrepreneurs have that too, where it's like something that's really successful and making money is just not fulfilling you. That's yeah. another like turning point, which that was probably a harder turning point. Cause I was like, now I'm about to stop this income stream. When in theory, what I really should have done is had a manager hand it off. Like that's why I look up to you because you you've done it. What I feel is like, Oh, that's mm-hmm. the correct way of doing it. You want to move on to the next thing. You don't light a match and pour gasoline. It's like you position somebody <laughs> to take it over. So there's still an income stream coming in. Yeah. Then you go to the next thing. It was like, yeah. obviously, you know, you don't just yeah. run away just and towards the building. Like blow it up. A- <laughs> That's funny. Do you feel like this is almost like Pavlov's hierarchy of needs? You know what I'm talking about? Where the, he talks about like, um, if you are in a position where you need food and water, and I'm, I might butcher this, but your only focus <laughs> is to survive at that point. You're just looking for food and water. And, the, you know, eventually you get that. Okay, now it's like, I need shelter. Okay, you get that. Then you're yes. at another level. Then it's like, okay, I need a car. And after that, it's like, okay, now it's like, I have everything. I feel like I need to survive. And now I can focus on others and be... And so I think your journey in entrepreneurship as you know, people's is typically like that. You start something that just provides you some income. You do that mm-hmm. for a while, like, ooh, you know what? I never really enjoyed that so much. What I really want to do is this. So having that income coming in from the thing you didn't really enjoy so much, maybe you did enjoy it. That's great if you did. But it's okay to have something that you're doing that is maybe not the, the thing for you. It's providing an income. It's providing that basic need. Allows you to quit your job maybe even. But then having that income coming in then frees you up to think, okay, got that going. I've put a team in place. I got a system in place, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about on this podcast. (laughs) Now, what do I really want to do? Um, And so that will free you up to think about that question and and start dabbling and and taking action in that direction. Like, Ooh, that, yeah, that I like this. that, That doesn't, I don't like this about it. Allows you to experiment because you got money coming in and you're not like, Yes. fighting for survival about, you're not looking yes. for your next yes. meal because your business is going along well so that would be a fun I, I think another thing i identified on me is like i, I am a survivor like I, i've started at zero a lot of times so I, i'm not afraid to jump and into the action like having right. a successful e-commerce business and then just dumping it and jumping was terrifying to everybody around me. Everything I do is terrifying to a lot of people around me, but I think I've done it so much that it's like, 
this is how I operate. Just right. not understanding there's a better way of doing it. Just yeah. this is my habit for doing this. I need to break out of this habit because it's not helping me in the long term. I should have had that successful business continue to be a successful business. It doesn't prevent me from moving on. I just have to mm -hmm. set it up in a way that somebody else can take over or manage. Then it allows me to go on to the next thing. I just love the next like thrilling thing of like taking nothing and turning it into something. Yeah. But it's it's a good skill to have. But the way that I was operating was not the correct way to operate. Mm -hmm. But I think from what you were talking about, like, do you love it? Or the people that find what they love, you'll never work a day in your life. I think there's two sides of this. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever truly found the thing that I love. So I think that's why I continue to just like run after something. Cause I was like, I'm trying to find what I love. I'm way closer today than I was when I started, uh -huh. but I think there is a doing action that mm -hmm. comes something that hits a pain point that then like the self-reflection comes into where you are, you have to ask yourself, do I like this and I enjoy it? Yes. What is it I, that I want to do? And then mm -hmm. you're building that. I'm extremely jealous and envious of people that can just like, I'm a graphic designer. I go to work at this company. I'm a graphic designer. I'm fulfilled every day. I come home. I get to turn off work. I get to do whatever I want, go on a boat, fish, mm -hmm. whatever. I am jealous of that because I've never had that. I'm getting closer to it now where it's like, I, I enjoy this and I enjoy this activity and this activity mm -hmm. and I can line it up in such a way where like my day is full of enjoyment. Yeah. But those people that have it right off the bat, I'm very jealous of. But I think if you're an entrepreneur and you feel like you're jumping all over the place, I would just implore you to take a step back and just like assess what you're doing and the parts that you enjoy and then try to get rid of those parts that you don't enjoy. And nice. I think that's another reason why I'm very excited about this podcast and working with you where it's I've learned over the year to get to where I'm at. There are tasks that need to get done in the business, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to do it going from right. solo entrepreneur to community to then like mentor to then now I have a team of people that's where it's like the most freeing for me because I go, I can still accomplish this task and do this business, but I don't have to be involved in the parts that I don't want to. I can custom create my own office building and dictate yes. what floors I want to be on and operate it the way that works best for me. True. But it's just handing off those tasks that I don't enjoy and everybody's different. And I think that's why I love that entrepreneur story because it just it shows where people start to where they are now is yes. just a wild ride and <laughs> just picking up those yes. cues of like ah oh, yeah i did that too and oh i didn't like that and i didn't enjoy that oh yeah i did have the money and i, I was unfulfilled and i can identify that i think everybody kind of has the general chapters every story is not the same but the general chapter is like yeah. oh you hit that level too where you were doing a thing and you didn't like it yeah me too <laughs> yep. it's a, like a kinship with other entrepreneurs it is yep absolutely Wow. Anything else about your story that you want to share before we wrap <laughs> no, up No, but I this want episode? you to tell the story how we oh, met. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. So you talked about the um, the auction. So I, um, because I I saw how successful it was for Jim to have that auction and be able to give some money to a cause he cared about. In 2017, I also had an auction for my brother and sister-in-law's orphanage in Guatemala. It was an eBay auction and I partnered with Jim and a couple other people to put together a package on eBay. Uh, for um for a fundraiser and so we posted it and steven won that auction and so he emailed me after i don't remember what the amount was but he emailed me afterwards i think it was the said, same 2500 and it was the same thing i i prayed about it it was mine like mine was 1500 yours really, was 1500 too uh maybe it was 1500 i don't remember i just remember it was a it was at a point where i i did a large product shipment for a lot of shopping that we were doing uh -huh. and it was we were extremely thin and I was like, this is all the money that we have right now. And if, wow. if that product that I bought doesn't really work out, this is really going to set us back. But again, <laughs> not the fear of that for me, but just like I, my, I'm married now and my mother's living with us. So my actions don't just affect me. I need to really sit down and pray about it. And I, I pray with my mom, I pray with my wife. And then we all kind of talked about it and we all felt this was the right move, but it was yeah. a very stretching point to where it's like, this is maybe unwise, but something is calling me to do this. Yeah, and I remember hearing your story it. and it was just like, it was the same connection through yes. it. Yes. So you emailed me also. And because I was going to do a 30 minute or an hour phone call, I think is what I put in there. And uh, you emailed me and said, can I pull a Ryan Rieger and come to Texas and hang out with you and go to lunch? And you and your wife, Desi did. And we spent three hours at lunch and got to know you. And as a, as a result of that, you know, we've done multiple things together. I don't think it was necessarily, it's that started it. I mean, we call, probably could have met other ways, but that definitely 
shorten the amount of time that it took to yes. you know get comfortable with each other and sure. projects together and um, other things. And so, yeah, that's just, um, and that's a whole other topic. We can talk about who are you trying to come about the with. Dream 100 strategy that we, our friend Dana Derricks talks about. And, you know, who is it that is your dream client, your dream uh, just partner in a business, somebody you wish that would promote your stuff? You know, how do you get on their radar? And there's a lot of different ways to do that in a, in a non um, sleazy, weird, <laughs> sleazy, uh, manipulative way. It's like, literally, how can I serve this person? You, uh, you do that um, amazingly well, like you've come into our audiences and, and served and, and that's really, uh, been a blessing. And now it's served you well too, because now we're, uh, you partnered with a lot of cool people and it's brought in income for you. I think this idea of business is to me like, yes, the day-to-day -day operations might be like you build SOP standard operating procedures and they're in order and it's like an assembly line, you kind of knock it out. But to, to really grow, I think it is relationship based. I, I it think it's more of who you know than what you know. Right. I, I always look for other people's success and try to emulate that success. But I think once I identified like, oh, you can reach out to these people and talk to them and like really leapfrog your success mm -hmm. yeah it wasn't like i i was trying to turn that money into a relationship that i get to talk to ryan it was like it's right. just this is a way for me to because i've i met you before for like maybe two seconds when i shook your hand at the very mm -hmm. first ces it was like i've met him i know right. him it was like a, a sense of pride for me but it was like for you it was probably like <laughs> you shook a hundred hands <laughs> you're not gonna remember the one hand you shook but to to sit down with you for an hour it would have taken me a lot of live events, a lot of like being on the different lives right. that you do and to like build up that relationship where it's like, I get to sit down with you and two hours at one time put together is going to to at least start this relationship where it's like before right. it was get in front of you, be nice, shake your sure. hand. Like, does he know who I am? Am I on his radar? This put me right. on your radar and we can just start to talk. I think it was yes. more for me. Like I identify and relate to so many things that Ryan has done that thing that he did with Jim was amazing then because I heard that story long before you you had the auction then as soon as you had the auction I was all in but then I realized the position yeah. that I'm in I have other people that I have to run this by I can't just yeah. like do what I normally do is jump <laughs> I had to make sure this is the right call and right decision then that turned into a relationship and I think this has also helped me in business so just like oh relationship is a super yeah. powerful thing how can I get the relationship with this person what are the skills like you were talking about Dana Derrick's like what are the possible things I could do to help build this relationship they're not sleazy they are winning an auction if that's the thing it is being on the live it is answering the different questions going to events that they're at and shaking their hands and not trying to get married on the first date but just like introduce yourself do you remember the first time we shook hands at this, the very first CES I don't because that was so, a big, that's what I'm saying like I, it was to me it was like we connected but I was like <laughs> it's a unrealistic feeling i know that you're there you're presenting a hot pitch people are me, meeting you it's it's not a standout thing but if i would have shaken your hand there and the next one shook your hand and made sure i came up to you it, yeah. it was i wasn't going to all of them or going directly after you to like connect right. with you but it was a way for me to see an in to yeah. now be connected because i was like yep. i know ryan i feel like i i know him he might not know who i am let me try to get in front of him so that we can have a relationship because if we went to that if you said no i don't want to go lunch with you and just had a call and we didn't connect it wouldn't have happened. And I'm okay with that. Right. And I would have been okay because there were other things about that auction that I really wanted to help out with. Right. But it did lead to this amazing thing. Yes. I think this is what I'm leaning into is business is all about relationship. It is. And I love that part of it. Yep. Great place to end there. Well, thanks guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hopefully you enjoyed our stories. That went way longer than I thought we'd go, but that's what happens when we get together. We just, uh, we just talk and talk and have, and we have fun. So hopefully you're enjoying this. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Take it easy.